Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah wa salatu wa salamu ala ashraf al-anbiya wa al-mursaleen. Sayyidina wa maulana wa habibina Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam tasliman kathiran. Again, assalamu alaikum everyone. Alhamdulillah, we are here for our third session of purification of the heart. Thank you for being here. I made a few announcements before we officially began to those who were here early, just to again up to, uh, keep everybody uh, on the same page. We've switched over to the webinar format. So the chat box is open and I invite you to participate via the chat box. Uh, I'll ask you some questions right now because I want to begin inshallah and we'll begin like we did last time with a bit of a little bit of a quiz. Okay. So if you remember from last uh, two sessions that we had, uh, or if you have notes, maybe you want to take those notes out and quickly look them over. Okay. And the first question I have is who can tell me who the original author is of the text, the Arabic text that we are talking about here, okay? Because there's an, a person who lived 200 years ago, about 200 years ago. Uh, very good, alhamdulillah. So we have some answers, good job. So I'm just gonna make a slight correction because all of you have answered the same answer. So his name is actually Imam al Mawlud. okay? So a, a lot of you are responding Imam Mawlud, which is fine, it's like a quick way of saying it but the accurate uh, name is Imam Al-Mawlud, okay? Just wanted to clarify that, very good. So Alhamdulillah, this is Imam Al-Mawlud's text and he lived about roughly close to 200 years ago. Um, who is the person who translated the, the book uh, from Arabic into English? What's his name? Very good, mashallah, excellent. Okay, and what, uh, where does uh, Sheikh Hamza, all of you mashallah who are answering Hadith, you were the first to come in, very good, and Shamina, Second, Bilal, third, awesome. Great job, you guys. Amen as well, great job. And Layla, all of you are answering it wonderfully. Uh, where does uh, Sheikh Hamza currently live? Where is he situated? What part of the world? Bay Area, oh, there we go. We got Bay Area and then we got Yassine with the correct answer, Berkeley, very good. So he's in Berkeley. Uh, does he have a special um, you know, place that he works at? And if so, what's the name of that place? Who can tell me the name of the place? Very good, mashallah. Amen, you came in there. And Hadith, is, Hadith you, you said Zaytuna, but Amen got the full answer for Zaytuna College. Very good. Awesome, you guys. So did Yusuf, Bilal, Yassin um, as well. Awesome. Okay, so next, um, we, we right away talked about the, uh, a certain number of hearts. Who can remember the very first heart that we talked about? Okay, there were a certain number um, of hearts. You can tell me if you want the number of hearts, but what was the first one that we covered? Very good, mashallah. So Ismail uh, answered eight. Awesome, good job, Ismail. And then Yasin came with the first heart as the dead heart. You guys are on it, excellent. The first heart was in fact the dead heart, very good. And what's the last heart called? If you can give me the Arabic name, even better. The last heart that we talked about. Very good. Amen came in with the sound heart. Awesome. And what's the Arabic of the sound heart? Mashallah. Sali, very good. Shamina, awesome. Great job, you guys. You guys are doing really well. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Okay, so um, we covered a few different uh, you know, diseases already. Who can remember the very first disease that we covered? And the first one. Okay, Yasin came in with miserliness. Very good. What's the Arabic? Bilal, you answered me before I even finished that question. You are awesome. Great job. And Hassan, very good. You guys know the Arabic terms. Awesome. Uh, what is um, the disease of the heart? Now I'm going to switch up the questions a little bit to so try to pay attention to the definition, okay? What is the disease of the heart where you're too, you can't control your uh, excitement and it makes you prideful. It makes you maybe want to spend on things a little bit too much. It's like you can't control it. It's too exciting. And that leads to uh, extravagance. Uh, very good. Awesome. Afnan. Great job. Wantonness. Very good. What is the Arabic uh, of wantonness called? Afnan again, look at you, mashallah. Very good, that's so exciting when you guys get it right like that, awesome. Okay, so there's another disease of the heart. I want, I'm gonna give you the Arabic term. 
I want you to quickly, okay, it's like lightning. Uh, you're going to type it out, the English of it. What is the English meaning of the word borod? Who can tell me? Borod. Wow, Afnan, man, mashallah, you are just ahead of everybody right now, huh? You're coming really quick, super fast. Mashallah, you guys are awesome. Okay, next, this is the disease of the heart where you harm uh, people or things for no reason whatsoever. You're just not having a good day and you, you, you feel like you can hurt something. Awesome. Bilal came in with it, with the word iniquity. Very good, Bilal. Mashallah. Uh, who can tell me the uh, Arabic w w name of that? Oh, mashallah. B uh, Bilal, you were, what, you're, you're like right there with me. Huh? You know what I was going to ask, didn't you? Very good. We got Bilal, we have Ihsan and Afnan. You guys, all three of you got the word. It's Baghi, Baghi, right? Great job, you guys. I am so impressed, mashallah. Okay, this disease of the heart, the Prophet Sallallahu said in a hadith he was worried that towards the end of time we would be like the froth of the ocean and he said we would have wahan in our hearts and then the companion said what's wahan ya rasulullah and he said this disease of the heart what is it very good mashallah ihsan bake awesome love of the world habba dunya now you're on it see that's what i love ihsan you went with the english and the arabic in one answer Pay attention, you guys. That's a really smart way of getting the full answer, right? He's showing me he knows both. Great job. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Okay, then we went on to another disease of the heart. This is when you see something in someone and you can't uh, control your desire for it and you actually want them to lose it. What is the Arabic of it? There we go, mashallah, excellent. So Yasin got this, Ehsan again came through, Bilal, Shamina, all of you, you guys got kind of all answered at the same time. It just came rolling in, Amen, Taslim, good job, awesome. Very good, alhamdulillah. Um, this is a disease of the heart that the Prophet ﷺ said, it consumes your good actions like fire consumes wood. What is the name of that disease of the heart? Let's see who was paying attention. It consumes your good actions like fire consumes wood. Is it jealousy? Ah, I kind of tricked you guys there and some of you fell for it, but Shamina, or I'm sorry, who, is the, who did I see? Aisha came through. It is envy, you guys, envy. Remember, envy and jealousy are kind of used, you know, oftentimes, uh, you know, to mean the same thing, but they are slightly different. Envy, you want the other person to lose what they have. Jealousy, you just want it and you're insecure about things, okay? So that's why where it comes from, whereas envy is just really, you know, about having it and wanting the other person not to have it. So very good. And Hasad, very good. Hadith, thank you, is the Arabic ver a word for envy. Excellent. You guys are really doing wonderful. Mashallah, tabarakallah. Uh, what is, okay, this is the trick question, or not trick question. This is the bonus question. Let's see who can get the bonus. Okay, if you get this one, mashallah. Halas, you're really paying attention. So let's say Ahmed, I'm just making up someone. Ahmed sees Bilal. And Bilal is memorizing the Quran, and he's got Juz Amma memorized, and now he's on to the 29th Juz, and he's doing really good. And then Ahmed goes, man, I wish I could be like Bilal. He's got so much Quran memorized. Why can't I do that? I'm going to go find a teacher, and I'm going to do this. What is that called? Yes, Bilal got it, mashallah. How, per how perfect is that, right? Because Ahmed and Bilal, Bilal, you're, you're on it, mashallah. This is ghibta, okay? Ghibta is what? Ghibta is a good form of uh, jealousy, right? It's when you're competing for good things. So when you're trying to gain knowledge, what's the other reason that the Prophet ﷺ said you can have ghibta for? So if you're, it's good jealousy, right? It's good to compete with, with someone for this. So one is knowledge. What's the other thing? Who can remember? Come on, you guys can do it. You, you've been doing amazing so far. Wisdom and knowledge kind of go hand in hand, right? Because you have to be wise, you know, or if you have knowledge, hopefully you're wise, right? Um, okay, very good. Afnan, mashallah, it's what you you're gave is, I think, a pretty good answer. And Yusuf as well. Wealth or sadaqah, so the means to... Um, to do things, right? So if you see someone who has a lot of wealth, you can have 
ghibta for that person as long as your intentions are good, right? You want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala so you have that jealousy like, oh, I wish I had that kind of money so that I could do a lot of good in the world, right? Like help orphans, right? This is a great uh, cause, right? Um, or uh, build a masjid. So there's a lot of uh, great, great things that you could do with the money. And if you have ghibta for someone who's wealthy, that's okay. Or for someone who has knowledge. You guys are so amazing. Jazakumullah khairan. I love that you guys are paying attention and you're remembering stuff that makes me so, so, so happy. So may Allah bless all of you. Now, are you ready to start our third session? Because we're going to introduce you to three new diseases of the heart. You guys ready? Pay attention now, okay? Or, and take some notes if you uh, want to. But let, let me go ahead and pull up my presentation to make sure that we are ready. So I'm going to first screen share. Bismillah. And I sh you should be able to see my screen. And now we're going to go into presenter mode and boom. Okay, you guys see it, yeah? Inshallah, let me actually pull up the chat so I can see what you guys are saying. Um, so what do you guys see on the screen? You see week two? Alhamdulillah, Sister Hussain looks perfect. Okay, Alhamdulillah. Thank you, Jazakallah Khairan, Sister Amara. All right, here we go, ready? So week two, we had week one last week. We did two sessions. This is where we're at now. So we're going to cover these diseases this week, inshallah, okay? Uh, for today's session, I only did the first three uh, just because I I didn't have honestly enough time to prepare more and also number 10 is a big one and I want to kind of uh, focus on that a little bit more on Thursday so we'll get through the remaining uh, four inshallah on Thursday okay but for today we're going to go over blameworthy modesty which is Hayat Damim and then that is holding on to one's wealth uh, oh I'm sorry did I not oh no I think I unfortunately forgot to um, uh, cut and paste the proper uh, column here on the right. Let me go back to the previous slide. I hopefully have it here somewhere. We're just going to do a quick rewind, rewind uh, to here. This is, uh, where did we go? Not here, here. All right, so we're going to go to number seven, eight, and nine. Okay, so my bad. I forgot. I didn't properly uh, cut and paste this definition part of it, so I apologize. So number seven, Blameworthy modesty is shyness or cowardice that prevents someone from addressing a wrong or inquiring about a need. So what does that mean? It means when you are too shy to act in, the, in a time where you should act. Let's say you're listening to a teacher like myself, or maybe you're at the masjid and there's a khutbah going on, and they say something that is... Um, not clear. Like maybe I say something to you that's not clear. And then you're like, oh, should I ask or not? Should I say something? Should I raise my hand and go, teacher, teacher, I didn't understand that, right? Sometimes our shyness prevents us from acting when we should. So we're going to talk more, but that's just a quick example of that, okay? Blameworthy thoughts. These are thinking about things that are prohibited, okay? Like if you're just letting your mind kind of wander on and you're just thinking about things you shouldn't think about, and we'll talk about what we mean with that, okay? But anytime you have thoughts that are just really pointless or it's a waste of your time, that would fall under blameworthy thoughts. And then fear of poverty. So that is when you're so afraid of, you know, not having enough food or wealth or material things that it creates this anxiety in you and it almost basically kind of destroys the way that you live your life, right? A lot of people, and it's somewhat kind of could be tied to miserliness because if you have a fear of poverty, it might lead you to become someone who's hoarding their wealth, right? Because it's like, oh no, I can't spend too much money because I, you know, I'm going to be poor or I'm going to not have a home to live in. Or, and it, those thoughts can kind of just really take someone to a very dark place where they lose, you know, complete trust in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we're going to talk about those three diseases uh, today. So let me now fast forward really quickly. Let's see how fast I can go. Okay. And I'm going to click as fast as I can. Okay. But how fast was that? Ah, nope. Here we go. Here we go. <laughs> Wrong one. Okay. So here we are. We are on uh, again, blameworthy modesty. So first, before we even get to blameworthy modesty, let's be clear about what the word modesty means, okay? So Muslims, we know this word. It's a very big part of our 
faith, but sometimes we need to really have a broad understanding of modesty because it's not just about our clothing. Okay, a lot of times when we hear modesty, it's reference to dressing uh, modestly, right? But it's more than that. It's about being humble and not showing off. And when we say showing off, this obviously includes showing off our bodies, right? Which is why we dress, we cover, we dress modestly because we don't show off the things that are private, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told us to be modest in the way that we dress. So it's about not showing off our bodies or our good deeds, skills, strengths, whatever gifts Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us, if he's blessed us with, if you're a modest person, you don't show off. Okay, why? Because you're confident. You don't have a need or a reason to be a show off. Someone who shows off, they're insecure, right? They're insecure. They feel like I have to show this because then I get attention. And if I get attention, it makes me feel good about myself. Muslims, we don't look to other people for attention. We look to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He's the only one whose opinion of us matters. So we don't feel the need to walk around and strut our stuff and, you know, uh, show our skin because a lot of people in this culture, right, you see them all the blah. And as the temperatures get warmer, they start, you know, wearing inappropriate clothing, right? And when they do that, our job as Muslims, because we don't judge people, right? We do not judge people. We say that, leave everybody to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I have actually a really good story that, that um, I'm going to share in a moment about not judging people. Um, but but, but when, when we see someone who's dressed in an inappropriate way, we show our modesty by what? Lowering our gaze, right? So here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, tell believing men to lower their glances and guard their private parts, right? So you lower your uh, eyes so that you don't see things that are immodest. And you also cover yourself, right? You, you cover your air, private area. That is pure for them. God is well aware of everything they do. And then say to the believing women, oh, excuse me. Ah, where am I? Sorry, you guys. I'm butterfingers here. Okay. Um, ah, <laughs> I'm trying to move this uh, little chat box because it's in the way of the text. So I apologize. Okay. So say to the believing women that they should lower their gaze and guard their modesty, that they should not display their beauty and, um, and ornaments except what must ordinarily appear, right? Our hands, our face, uh, that they should draw their veils over their bosom. So you see where our hijab, we cover ourselves, right? This is how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala instructs Muslim men and women to dress. We dress in a modest way, right? And I'm just going to quickly tell you guys a story that this really actually happened to me. I was once... Um, uh, at an airport, and this was a long time ago, where I was younger and I didn't know a lot of things, and I thought that, you know, I'm better than people because I was wearing hijab, and so I did. I kind of let my arrogance, self righteousness, which we'll talk about, right? Which sometimes you get a little too, uh, you think of yourself as better, and this is dangerous. It's a disease of the heart. But if you don't know it's a disease of the heart, then you can have it. So when I was much, much younger, this happened to me, where I was in hijab and I was at the airport. And I was waiting for my ride. And all of a sudden I see this woman and she gets out of her car. You know, she's, uh, you know, when you're at the airport and you're waiting for people to pick you up, you have to kind of wait there and all these cars are coming and going. So she got out of her car and she was dressed very uh, inappropriately. She was wearing shorts, uh, very short shorts and like, you know, a tank top. And I just looked at her and I judged her. I did. I thought like, wow, why is she dressed like that? It's so wrong. And, and I had all these negative thoughts. And then subhanAllah, she ended up, it was kind of, a, it was a very strange experience for me because I'm just waiting there. I don't know her. She's a stranger, but she ended up closing the trunk of her car and she saw me and then she started walking towards me. So I'm like, whoa, what's going on? Why is this woman who's like a stranger walking to me, right? What is she going to say? And I'm like, you know, so I kind of was like a little like, you know, just paranoid, like what's going to happen now? All of a sudden, she comes and she stands in a very humbled state, very humble. She has her head down and she goes, Salaam Alaikum. Uh, I know I'm not dressed very appropriately. Uh, you know, may Allah forgive me. I'm a Muslim, I'm a convert, and I'm raising my son to be a Muslim. I saw you and I was so happy because I thought maybe you can help me, give me some recommendations for children's book because I want to raise my son as a Muslim. So she's saying all of this stuff to me, subhanAllah, right? She's not dressed modestly. I'm dressed modestly, but this is where we look at the hearts, right? Her heart was in such a good state because she recognized her mistake. She was humble and she wanted to be better. 
but I let arrogance in my heart, right? I thought I was better and I was judging her. And then Allah, he's the one who made this whole event happen, right? She, I, there's no way I would have ever thought she was a Muslim, the way she was dressed. But Allah wanted me to have that experience because it did, it changed my mind about a lot of things. I, I started to really look at my heart more and say, oh, Sai, how could you have let your heart become so filled with arrogance that you walk around judging people because of the way that they're dressed, right? That's not for you to do. You, you don't judge people. We don't judge people. We, we know what's right and what's wrong, but we leave the, the judgment to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? There, he's the only one who judges. So when we say that, yes, we live in a society where a lot of people are not dressed appropriately, our job is not to look down on them because they don't know. Many pe times people don't know. This uh, woman, she was a convert and she was trying to be better. So, you know, just like Islam took uh, 23 years to complete, some people, they take time getting a good habit. So we just have to leave the judgment alone. But what we do, instead of judging them, we turn our gaze away and we wish well for them, that Allah guides them. Okay, so that's what this hadith is telling us to lower your gaze. Don't, you know, judge other people, lower your gaze. And I wanted to share that story so that you have an example of when sometimes it's not black, so black and white. You know, you might see a Muslim and think, oh, they're amazing. And then you see someone dressed like that and think, look at them. But if you really, you know, judge that situation, who was, who was better and who wasn't, right? She was much better than me. And that was a humbling moment for me. And I'm so grateful to Allah that he did that for me because it literally changed everything. My perception of everything was different then. I started looking at the diseases of the heart and realizing I had a lot of them. And that's uh, how I, uh, alhamdulillah, benefited from this amazing uh, science of, of you know, purification of the heart. So alhamdulillah. Okay, so now what else uh, do we know about modesty? Okay, here we have another hadith where Qura ibn Ilyas reported that we were once with the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam when modesty was mentioned to him. And uh, someone said, oh, Messenger of Allah, is modesty part of faith? And the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, what? Rather, it is the entire religion, SubhanAllah. So this is a very big part of being a Muslim. Then he said, verily, modesty, abstinence, reticence of the tongue, but not the heart and deeds are all part of faith. They bring gain in the hereafter and loss in the world. What is gained in the hereafter is much greater than what is missed in the world. So why did I put that phrase, reticence of the tongue but not the heart in yellow? Because this is telling us that reticence means when you're holding back, right? You're holding back. Um, we should hold back with our tongues when we, uh, you know, maybe there's a situation and that, that uh, you know, we don't like or, you know, that w where the judgment might take over, we shouldn't comment, but not in our heart. Our, in our heart, we should be very clear about what's right and what's wrong, okay? And that kind of ties into what blameworthy modesty is. So let's uh, be a little bit more clear here. So again, modesty is something, a whole religion, every part of us, we should, uh, I mean, our part of our faith thing is, uh, modesty is a big part of that. But it, we have to understand that this, um, quality has to be in balance, right? Between one's spiritual heart and one's conscience. So here we have praiseworthy modesty activates the conscience, right? And protects the spiritual heart. It helps one to lower the gaze, protect the heart from being exposed to things that bring it harm. But blameworthy modesty impairs the conscience and by extension, the spiritual heart. It prevents one from acting or speaking up when it is necessary, and it invites cowardice into the heart to become a coward, right? That's what blameworthy modesty does. You're, you're not very courageous when you have blameworthy modesty, and this is not part of our faith. We should be people of courage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? So let's look again at some examples. So for example, as I said earlier, not asking questions about one's deen out of shyness. So if you're ever not clear about something, but because you don't want to embarrass yourself with your friends in the class, or you, you know, maybe in a situation where you don't know all the students, you feel a little awkward about talking, remember this. You don't want to have blame or the modesty. It's much more important that you speak up. And you don't have to speak up right then and there. Maybe after the class, right? You can go to the teacher and say, um, Mr. or you know, sister or brother or who, you know, Sheikh or Sheikha, um, I didn't understand when you said this. Can you please explain it to me? 
but not to be shy in the class and then even after the class go oh no i don't want to go up to the teacher and you know um and and have uh you know this conversation with them that's too embarrassing because then it's like i didn't know and everybody else seemed to get it and i don't want to look like i'm not smart and all of those thoughts that's what blameworthy modesty is right when you sit there and you have this conversation with yourself that you're too worried about how you look in front of other people um and it prevents you from learning right and so at the bottom you see this hadith here Aisha, the prophet's wife, uh, may Allah be pleased with her, said, how excellent are the women of the Ansar? These are the women of Medina, right? They do not allow shyness to prevent them from asking questions and understanding the religion. So she's making an observation here that says what? That look at how amazing these women of the Ansar are. They uh, ask their questions. They're not clear about something. They're not going to go, oh, I'm just going to that's it, okay. I'll pretend like I understood it. Right. And it, this doesn't have to just be for religion. You know, let's say you're in a math class or you're in another class. Um, you know, you should, you know, have the courage to always, if there's some, some knowledge that's being taught to you and you don't get it to uh, make that a priority instead of yourself. Right. It's not about how you appear because very wise people are okay admitting that they don't know. Imam Malik, who is one of the great four Imams, uh, of, you know, of the schools of fiqh that we have, he was known to very commonly say, I don't know. When people would ask him questions, he would say, I don't know. And this shows not that he doesn't have knowledge, but the opposite, that he's actually very wise. And he had, he, I mean, he was very, very knowledgeable. He's one of the great imams, but he had the humility to know when he didn't know, right? And so we shouldn't let our shyness of not knowing prevent us from knowing. That's what blameworthy modesty is, one example. Another is not standing up for someone who's being wronged. So if you see a situation, let's say there's a bully, right? And he's bullying or she's bullying someone and you're just standing there. You know it's wrong, but uh, you can't find the courage to say something, right? Or to do something, to put a stop to it. We find this problem everywhere now in schools and in other places. A lot of um, people, not just youth, but like adults too, they freeze up and they don't say something when they should. And then they watch. And instead, unfortunately, with phones now, they're recording it, you know? So it's like, here, you're watching someone get beat up in front of you. And instead of acting, you're just going to record the video. Like, that's really not good, right? Because you're, you're not helping these people at all. The one who's doing the, the harming and the one who's being harmed, both of them need help. Right, and that's what Muslims are called to do. The Prophet told us we help, you know, the oppressed and the oppressor, and we help the oppressor by stopping him from being oppressive. So you want to separate people when they're fighting because you know the one is getting hurt, but the other one is also causing a lot of damage. So let's help both of them. If this happens, you know, especially with friends or people that you know, you should be worried about both not having the courage to uh, stand up to an unjust person. So in the first situation, you're not protecting someone who's being harmed. But in the next situation, it's where you, you're not confronting that person who's doing the bullying, right? And saying, listen, what you're doing is wrong and you need to stop it. This is all, you know, part of, again, um, what, what can take over someone if they have blameworthy modesty. And then also not participating in something worth, worthwhile and beneficial out of shyness. So this is similar to, um, you know, what we've talked about, which is you see something either that's harmful that you should address or that's beneficial, but your shyness prevents you from getting it, like the knowledge, right? Or let's say, you, you know, everybody, uh, all of your cousins and friends want to go somewhere and um, maybe you, uh, you're kind of like, let's say they want to go roller skating, okay? And you've never roller skated before. But the idea of it is like, oh man, I don't want to do it because I, I don't know how to do it and I don't want to go and embarrass myself. Um, so then you, you don't go. You end up going, no, I don't want to go. All because you let this shyness prevent you from actually benefiting. You're going to spend time with your cousins and friends. You might learn a new skill, but there's a shyness there that prevents you. That's blameworthy modesty, okay? So hopefully this disease is clear. Now, how can we get rid of it? Or how can we treat it? Well, the first thing is that you put the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala before anyone else, okay? You're always thinking, as Muslims, we're always, always, always thinking first Will this make Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy or will it not make him happy? That is it. 
with everything that you do from the moment you wake up until the moment you sleep, that should be your thought process in everything. Because everything we know as Muslims, our deen is complete. Allah has given us answers um, about everything through the Prophet's example. But our deen, we know right and wrong. And we know, and if you don't know, that's what you have your parents for and other people, you ask questions. But in your mind, you that's how you check yourself. And that's how you prevent shaitan from making you do things that are wrong. You have that question. Is this going to make Allah happy or not happy? And then you act, right? But this is how we should be. So if we start putting that into practice, you'll find that even if you're uncomfortable with something, if you're thinking, okay, if Allah will be happy with me, I'll do it. Then inshallah, that courage will start to grow in your heart because you're always thinking of making Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala happy with you, okay? And um, I see a quick question. I'm seeing the chat box, but I'm sorry, I'm not able to answer every question, but this one is an important one that I do wanna talk about real quick. If you're scared of getting hurt, okay? Now the word vulnerable comes from, uh, I think it's Greek or Latin from vulnus, which means to be open to injury, okay? Um, and it, it means to be open to being wounded, okay? That's why we're, when we're ever in a situation where we're afraid to act, yes, that's part of it. We're worried. We're worried that we're gonna be rejected or embarrassed or humiliated, all of those things, right? But part of the youth experience is you're kind of in a test phase of your life where you're leaving childhood and you're growing into becoming an adult. And just like every adult before you, all of us went through the same experience. And every child after you will go through the same experience where you have to kind of test things out and, and get better and better. It's like a practice sort of phase, right? So if you want to grow and kind of go through that process, uh, you know, a little bit in a better way without too many uh, bumps along the road, then you have to say, you know what, there's a first time for everything and I got to try it and I have to muster up the courage. And even if I'm worried about everything, it's okay. It's probably, I'm probably making too much of a big deal out of it in my mind. Because if there's, you know, adults in the room, inshallah, they're all mature enough. They're not going to laugh at you or embarrass you or anything like that. Rather, they'll probably encourage you, even if things don't go your way. Let's say, like, go back to the roller skating example. If you're going to, if you don't want to go roller skating because you don't want to fall, right? I've, it's happened to me several times, even as an adult, you know, you can either fall and then make yourself feel bad and think, oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassing. And oh, why did I do this? I'm so a uh, failure. I don't even know how to roller skate. I have no coordination and let all those negative thoughts come in your mind or you can say dude I just roller skated for the first time and it's okay at least I had the courage to do it and even if I fell oh well people fall all the time even professional skaters fall there's people who've been at the Olympics and they fall so falling is just part of human human you know experience gravity is a force so it's not that big of a deal and instead of letting you know uh you know, shaitan or, or your own nafs make you feel weak, you want to say, you know what, let's just get back up and laugh it off. It's no big deal, whatever. You know, when I used to do it, when I was a kid, I would always like, if I tripped over something, I would always pretend like it was a new dance move. So I would just be like, oh yeah, check it out. That was, that was just me being cool. And I would just say something silly. And then everybody would laugh, right? Because my attitude was, I'm not embarrassed by this. I'm a human and it's okay to fall or have, you know, slip here and there. Even if you're talking, like I've been speaking publicly for a long time. Sometimes when you first start off, you, you get nervous and you're like, uh, 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 buh, 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 and you say things like that. It's okay because the more you do it, the better you get at it. And then you look back at those times, you just laugh like, oh yeah, that was me uh, practicing, you know, it was my practice runs and it's okay to, to have those experiences. So you got to get out of that mentality that, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm so scared of being looked at and embarrassed. Strong people are like, you know what? It's okay. It happens. Or, you know, I'm just going to keep trying, um, push forward. Okay. So thank you for that question. Now, another uh, thing to get rid of this is to ask questions when you don't understand something. Force yourself, get into that habit. I don't get it. I need more clarity because you know what? It's not that you necessarily have a, you know, like you don't, you didn't understand it and you're, there's something wrong with the way that your brain worked. What if it's the teacher? What if the teacher didn't explain things correctly? I'm a teacher. Certainly we are not perfect. There's times where we don't do a good job explaining something. So the students are confused. That's our fault. That's not your fault. So what you want to do is if any time you don't understand something, ask with humility, right? Don't assume that the teacher just failed to explain it, right? Just ask with humility and say, teacher, I'm sorry, I didn't quite understand something. 
But remember that it might not be that you didn't understand it well, it might be that the teacher didn't explain it well. By asking with humility and adab, this is always good, you allow the teacher to correct themselves, right? The teacher will come back and, uh, and hopefully explain it better for you, inshallah. So, but find that courage to be, I'm gonna ask that question, okay? And then practice more courage and use judgment when you see something wrong or an injustice. For example, you know, I said about the bullying thing. If you're seeing a situation where there's a physical fight, you don't have to jump in, okay? Uh, what I said earlier about stopping the fight and separating the people, I'm not saying to necessarily get into the fight and hurt yourself or get hurt. You don't need to do that. The judgment comes in to say, this is wrong. And instead of watching it happen and freezing, like, oh my gosh, this is, whoa, this is crazy. I'm just going to watch it. The judgment says, this is wrong. I need to go get an adult. And you, you're the one that leaves your backpack, tells a friend, watch this. I have to go run. And you go get the nearest teacher and say, teacher, teacher, come here. There's a fight happening. That is being a, a wise person. Because what you're doing is saying, I don't want to just let this happen and unfold and have an injury and someone really get hurt. You know, there's been some really terrible accidents, um, you know, recently. Like last year, I remember reading a story about a, a fight that happened at a school. And one of the students was unfortunately killed. He actually died because when the, the other student hit him, he fell and on a something like a cement a piece that was very hard and his head hit it really hard and he was injured and then he eventually died. So you never, God forbid, want to let people in that type of a situation get all the black carried away. But imagine you can save lives just by going and getting an adult. Okay. So that's what courage does. And that's uh, the opposite of this quality of blameworthy modesty. So inshallah, that's the first disease of the heart. We uh, need to move forward to the next one. So let's go ahead. This is going to, um, this is about the next uh, disease of the heart. So did you know, sorry, let me move this. I don't know if you guys can see all of everything on my screen, like the chat box and everything, but if you can, sorry. So did you know that the average person, average person means, you know, you can't obviously go around um, asking every single person on the planet. So what we do is we just kind of take a, a, a poll and then determine how many people from that group of people this would apply to. So the average person has about 12,000 to 60,000 thoughts per day. That's a lot of thoughts. Right. If you think about it from the moment you wake up until you sleep, you're thinking all the time. Your brain never really shuts off. Even when you're watching something like on TV or uh, playing a, a game, your well, for playing a game, your brain is definitely active. But if you're doing something more passive, like watching a show or a, a film, your brain is very active because it's understanding everything. It's processing everything. It's taking all those images in. Right. So there's a lot of activity and thoughts that are happening. But of those thoughts, this is what's really fascinating. 80% are negative. SubhanAllah. Isn't that sad? This is why is that the case? Why is that the case that 80%, more than 50% of our thoughts are negative thoughts? Right? They're not good thoughts. Well, we have, we know from our tradition, shaitan is real, right? He, he is the whisperer. He likes to uh, take away good feelings, good thoughts, good experiences, even our prayers, Right When we stand up for prayers, he loves to distract us. And suddenly we're thinking about things that we weren't even thinking about at all because he likes to just put all those thoughts in our mind. So 80% of those thoughts are negative and then 95% are exactly the same repetitive thoughts from the day before. So we tend to think about the same things over and over and over and over again. This is the human being. This is why you know we say Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us with these you know issues and we have to do the work of uh, purification of the heart and of, of the, you know, of the, uh, of the mind and of the tongue and all of the things that we have, we have to purify uh, our thoughts. We have to purify these things and there's ways to do that, inshallah. Okay, so let's look here. Next slide. Um, so what are specific things that we shouldn't think about, okay? Because negative thoughts can fall under a lot of different categories, or, you know, we could cover a lot of things, but we're going to talk specifically about two things. First thing that blameworthy thoughts, the thoughts that are not good, are thoughts that are about the nature of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, okay? Um, 
we have, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has revealed himself to us through the 99 names, the Asma al husna which are the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And of course, we have the Quran, which are his words and only his words. And then we have the Hadith Qudsi, which are uh, sort of like, they're revelations that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're not in the Quran, they're in the Hadith. But all of these things are Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala teaching us about who he is, right? So for us, we only base our knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala on what he's revealed to us. But sometimes our mind can start wandering and we start imagining things and we think about things that are not good to think about with relation to what does Allah look like and how is he? All of those thoughts are, we have to turn those thoughts off because there's, uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Laysa, uh, Laysa mithlihi shay, right? Which is what? There, he, there's nothing in creation that is like Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay, nothing in creation, which means that no, there's no way that we can try to imagine Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our mind, because everything in our minds is from what we see and what we know in the universe, right? So it makes no sense to try to think about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when he's told us that there's nothing that you can even come close to that would be similar to him. So don't even try. But have the hope that inshallah, we're going to inshallah see him in the next world. That's why we want to go to Jannah. The greatest uh, prize that we could possibly have is uh, to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Jannah. Okay. So this is why it's so important that you just turn off that thought and say, I'm not going to have those thoughts about Allah. I'm going to wait for the great prize of seeing him in Jannah. So that's the first thing that we want to you know, again, address. And then the other thing is to think bad thoughts about other people, like their faults, right? Um, a lot of times people will just waste their time thinking about other people, whether it's a stranger or someone you know, if you're just wasting your those precious thoughts for 60,000 thoughts and you're thinking about things that you shouldn't, this is the this is the this what falls under um, blameworthy thoughts, right? And the Prophet ﷺ said here, he said, there is a tree in paradise reserved for people whose own faults preoccupied them from thinking about other people's faults. So subhanAllah, if you spend more time on your own self and trying to fix yourself than you do thinking about, oh, why does this person dress this way? And they have such a bad habit and look at, you know, or they, you know, they play uh, basketball like this, or, you know, we can get very judgy about what people do, right? We'll pick apart everything about them. Um, that's haram. You shouldn't do that, right? We talked about this a little bit, I think, last time where we said there's ghibat uh, in the heart, ghibat al qalb, where you actually can, you know, have bad thoughts about people in your heart. And this is ghibat, which is, you know, gossiping and, and, and uh, it's really one of the worst sins. So um, we want to stop that, right? And Allah, the Prophet promised a tree, a special tree in paradise for people who were more worried about their own situation. So alhamdulillah, really important for us to think about. Okay, so next slide here so how do we um treat the this disease of the heart what's the way to fix it well we study the 99 attributes of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala commonly referred to as asma al husna we should know the 99 names and try to really understand their meanings and you can ask your parents questions like maybe one uh, attribute every day you know and then uh, in 99 days you'll know all of Allah's Pada's attributes or if you want to do more than one but you can really make it a very good exercise of um, just getting closer in your or better understanding of who Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is right by studying them and then um, remembering again as we said that it's beyond our abilities as human beings to really capture Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, so we shouldn't even bother. But at least if we try to connect to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through his attributes, it will deepen our love for him. And it'll help us to, again, follow his commands and prepares us for the hereafter where we hope to see Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And, and finally, all the questions that you have about, well, this doesn't make sense. And I never understood this. You can ask him then, inshallah. You know, we just have to be patient. And then Imam al-Ghazali said, sorry, uh-oh. Here we go. Sorry. Imam al-Ghazali said that the way to ward off distracting thoughts is to cut off their source. Uh, avoid the means that could create these thoughts. If the source of such thoughts is not stopped, it will keep generating them. Okay. So there are some things that um, 
and that, uh, you know, or some people sometimes that make you have bad thoughts about other people. And you have to, you know, have, don't have blameworthy modesty, right? You have to tell that friend, maybe, you know what, maybe we shouldn't make uh, talk about people because it's not good. That's really good. You're showing courage to tell that person it's wrong and you're preventing yourself from falling into bad habits and cutting it off from the source. So sometimes that's what you need to do. There's also other, um, you know, like television can be bad music. Music can be, there's bad elements in television, bad elements in, tele, in music. So if you're getting thoughts because of a certain show that you're watching or uh, music that you're listening to, stop. Very simple. Because if you don't, then those thoughts will just keep coming back, right? You just kind of have to cut them off at the source. Like, you know, this is making me not feel good or I don't feel positive after this. So I need to really, you know, stop this stuff. Inshallah. Okay. So that's how we uh, correct this disease of the heart. So the next one is... Let's see here, listen to that. Um, the next disease of the heart is fear of poverty, okay? Khawf al-faqr. So let's talk about what this is. Well, first, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to us in Surah Al-Baqarah, He says, those who in charity spend of their good deeds by night and by day, in secret and in public, have their reward with their Lord. On them shall be no fear nor shall they grieve. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us right here, whoever does, you know, good deeds we spend in charity and we do our, uh, you know, our good works in, in secret and in public. Maybe there's times where we want to show good works because we want to encourage other people. But then there's other times where we just go more inwardly and it's more private. In both of their situations, our reward is with Allah. And he is telling us, we, if you do these things and you do them the right way, the way that the Prophet ﷺ taught us, you won't have any fear. There's nothing to be afraid of because you understand that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with you, right? And that he's the one who uh, blesses us and, and he, he gives us uh, all of our risk, our food, our water, our clothing, our shelter, our families, all of the things that we have are from Allah. He distributes them to everybody. And until, the day, until we leave this earth, we will have our sustenance, our portion, right? Some people get more in this world. There's people who get more, more wealth. Uh, and some people don't, but everybody gets what is what Allah decides for them. And we have to respond by being patient and uh, grateful. That's so important that we're grateful for whatever Allah has given us because all of it is a treasure, right? And so here the Prophet said, charity does not decrease wealth. No one forgives another, but that Allah increases his honor and no one humbles himself for the sake of Allah, but that Allah raises his status. So charity does not decrease wealth. When you are a giving person, um, you should know, especially if you give in charity, that you, you're not, just because the money's leaving your hand, right? It's like, oh, here's a hundred dollars and I have to give it to this you know, organization or this poor person on the street. It might feel like you lost a hundred dollars, but you didn't. This hadith is telling you, you're actually gaining more and the reward will come. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will bring that $100 back and more to you at some point. And I've had this happen to me so many times, I can't even tell you, where you know you give for the sake of Allah and then all of a sudden it is, uh, it's, it's, he repays you maybe the same day, uh, you know, two, three, four times that amount, right? And I've had people have the same story. They've written a check and then in the mail, like the next day, they get the exact same amount for that check. That's happened to people before or twice uh, the amount, you know? So subhanAllah, we should never despair that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is always with us and he repays generosity with generosity. Remember that, he repays generosity with generosity. So the next slide here, remember that when you have khawf al-faqr, the problem is, is if all you think about all day long is money and it's all you see, right? And it's, you're just afraid of losing it, then what happens is, you're likely not going to do your obligations to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or your family. You're probably not going to be very good with your prayers. You're certainly, um, you know, won't be good with zakat and giving away sadaqah. You might not even want to go to on hajj because you're too worried about how much money it's going to cost you. Oh man, it's cost like $4,000 to go to hajj. I don't want to do that because what if I, you know, don't have enough money for next year or this. And you start thinking about all these things. So it prevents you from doing good deeds. And even your prayers, because if you're afraid of, uh, uh, you have khawf al-faqr, you might work overtime. And let's say you work so much that you forget to pray. 
because you're too worried about getting money. So this is the problem with being obsessed with money and not remembering that Allah is the one who gives to everybody and everybody will get the, what they deserve. Nobody will take away if Allah is destined for you to have something and he, it's written, nobody and nothing can prevent it from coming to you. So you just have to have that trust, right? But this is the danger of letting greed uh, or, you know, a khawf al faqr which can sometimes lead to greed, enter the heart, okay? <clears throat> so uh, another thing to also remember, excuse me, <clears throat> is this uh, verse from the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, take from their wealth a charity by which you cleanse them and purify them and invoke blessings upon them. What does this mean? It means that whenever we give charity, it actually cleans our wealth for us, okay? So I'm gonna explain a little bit more what that means. Um, where did that, oh, here we go. So this was supposed to be before the other one, but it's okay. So if you see this uh, cute, adorable little uh, boy, I'm thinking, boy, maybe girl, because she's got earrings on. Hmm. So let's just assume, boy or girl, either way, it doesn't matter. What is, uh, let's, you know, he doing, right? He's washing these, these clothes, okay? He's washing them with his hand. Most of us, we probably have never done this because our parents are taking care of our laundry. They put it in the washing machine. It comes out magically clean, right? But if you really think about it, when we play, right, on the left side, let's read. Sometimes when we play, we get our clothes dirty in the mud. Sometimes when we eat, we get stains on our clothes from food. Or when we work on an art project, right, we get some paint or glue or glitter all over our clothing. When we cook or bake, right, there's egg splatters, oil splatters, you know, flour, and our clothes can get really messy, chocolate, right? Uh, whatever it is, we know that we have to wash our clothes to keep our bodies clean and the rest of our clothes clean. Because otherwise, if you leave that dirt or that filth on your clothing, it might get, it, get on something else, right? So we understand that when it comes to our clothing. Well, with our money, with, uh, it's the same concept, that there's parts of our money that we're not always sure, is it coming from a halal source? You know, is there anything that maybe this money was involved in at some point that wasn't clean? Let me clean my money. Let me clean my wealth, right? Just like this boy is vigorously, you know, scrubbing away the, the, the dirt from the clothing. And how we do that is through sadaqah and charity. When we give part of our money for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah says it purifies the rest of our wealth. So whatever else we have saved is clean. Even if there was something, you know, that maybe wasn't... Um, halal in part of that wealth, right? So this is how charity works. It helps to clean our wealth and it's such an important part of that, right? Um, so let's see here, uh oh. So here's the treatment, okay? So how do we treat uh, for fear of poverty? First, we have a good opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and we remember that he is the one who again distributes to his creation whatever he wills, right? And we should have trust in him. Uh, he has no need for anything that we do, right? So even when we give for the sake of Allah or anything, we should remember Allah has no need for any of that, right? And he says here in the Quran, uh, chapter 51, verse 57, he says, I do not desire from people any provision, right? Which is anything, nothing. Nor do I desire that they feed me. So nothing we're doing is increasing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is above all of this, everything, right? He's not a human. He doesn't have needs the way we have needs. So when we do something for his sake, we have to put, uh, you know, remember that he, you know, we're not losing anything, right? Uh, we're actually gaining it because he has no need of what we give. And, that, and then the Prophet ﷺ told us that contentment is a treasure that is never exhausted. So we all want treasures, right? Everybody wants a lot of wealth and power and all of these things that we want, want, want. Well, the greatest thing that you can have is to be content, which is to be just grateful. Like, alhamdulillah, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you've given me um, a great life and I'm grateful for my health, for my family, for my, you know, pets for my siblings for my clothing for my toys for everything you just start naming things randomly right my books my school my teachers right i'm grateful for my friends so to be in a state of contentment it's like this treasure you just wow there's so much of it right but you have to do that as an exercise you have to think about all the things that he's given you and really sit there and go wow 
I have so much to be thankful for, right? Because there's a lot of people who had everything and then boom, something might have happened where they've lost things and they spend the rest of their life saying, you know, I wish I could have those things back. And they might be simple things that we take for granted, things that we don't even realize. You know, I remember like my teacher, uh, Sheikh Hamza, actually, he talked to us about, you know, think about like eyelashes, you know, how many of us have actually sat and thought, subhanAllah, we should be so grateful for eyelashes because they're so tiny, they're so small, and we have them, we were born with them, but they have a huge function because without eyelashes, um, things can get into your eyes. There's a lot of problems and then you can't see very well. There's people who have to constantly lubricate their eyes and keep them moist uh, because they don't have, you know, protection from these eyelashes. So there's things that, uh, same with the hairs in our nose. The hairs in our nose are so important because they protect us from having problems when we breathe. But how many of us, you know, look to that and go, wow, thank God I have hairs in my nose, right? Because who thinks like that? But if you actually think about, if I didn't have these hairs in my nose and all the green stuff inside of it that traps the dust particles, that's what those things are, right? The B word, you guys know what I'm talking about. People pick at them, it's ugh, gross. But anyway, it's another conversation. But those things are important to our health because if we didn't have those, then all of those, the dust that is in the air, would go into our lungs and we'd be coughing all the time. So do you see how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created us with this incredible machine where if you start thinking about all of its parts, it's like, wow, 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 amazing. Even the heart, you know, how much blood, it, it like uh, pumps out, I don't know how many gallons, hundreds of gallons of blood every day, or maybe thousands. It's a lot of blood that the heart is pumping through our system. But th it's like a machine, it's incredible. So this is what contentment does. When you're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it just opens this feeling of like, I have so much, I have a treasure already, I don't need more. And then you don't have fear of poverty. Okay, inshallah. So that is the session for today, you guys. Alhamdulillah. Um, those are the first, uh, the three that we're covering today. I want to hear from you. So we have a few minutes left, very few. I'll take uh, some questions if you have. I know there was a lot of conversation as we were going, um, but let's see if there's any questions about what we've covered. If you want to retype your question in a few minutes we have, I'm happy to, um, to answer your questions. Okay, bismillah. And then just a heads up about next week. I think I have, um, let me see. No, that's, so next week we will go over, I'm not, sorry, not next week, on Thursday. Ooh. We'll go over ostentation, relying on other than God, displeasure with divine decree and seeking reputation. Heads up, just for FYI. But let me go ahead and stop screen share here and we can now talk, um, inshallah. Okay, so let's see here. Uh, questions. I'm going to get back to the chat box. How many sessions will we have, inshallah? Uh, well, thank you for asking, sweetheart. We have Thursday, next Thursday, uh, this Thursday, and then the following Tuesday and the following Thursday. So that's one, two, three more sessions after today. All together, six sessions. And if for whatever reason, um, we may need to add one more because we don't finish them all. I'll let you guys know uh, if the possible seventh session, but for now, three more sessions, inshallah. Okay. Okay, so quick questions here. Uh, what if you're terrified of losing something other than money? So very good question. Um, you know, if you're afraid of in this world, you have to remember that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if, if you ever lose something of value or important to you in this world, inshallah, you have the hope of, you know, be patient with that loss because there's, you know, nothing happens in vain, which means there's always a wisdom of why things happen to us in this world, always. And you have to remember that Allah knows what's best for you. So maybe in that loss, uh, something really good can happen, right? For example, I'll tell you, um, there, you know, there's that organization called uh, MAD, Mothers Against Drunk Drivers, right? There was a, a mother, I'm assuming, I think it was a mother, but she, her, she lost her child in a car accident because of a drunk driver. So what did she do? She took that energy, right? That terrible loss, it was a horrible thing. To lose a child is the, one of the worst things that a 
person can go through. But instead of, you know, doing just being in a state of sadness for her whole life, she said, I am going to make sure nobody ever experiences what I went through. And she started this organization called MAD. And now it's international, I think, or definitely national, but everybody knows it. And it's to prevent people from drinking alcohol and driving. So she took that loss and did this amazing thing that's helped millions and maybe billions of people in the world. So you can turn loss into something positive if you always have a good opinion of Allah, that if he took something from you, there's a reason for it. And inshallah, with your patience, he'll replace it with something better. And he'll use you to do a lot of good with it if you're patient. But if you think like, oh no, I've lost it and now the world is over and now I, I'm going to fall into a state of depression, then you're forgetting that Allah is, uh, you know, he, he can uh, give you anything you want and you have to turn back to him and just ask him to give you patience with that loss and to replace it for something with something better for you in this world or, and, or, and reward you in the next world with it as well. Because, you know, some things are hard on us, you know. Um, uh, I lost, for example, my pet, uh, a, a f f uh, how many years ago, maybe nine years ago. And I think about her all the time I, and it hurts. It hurts because I loved her and it was a difficult circumstance, but I'm hopeful that inshallah, she's going to be with me in Jannah. I really do. I pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala helps uh, bring her to me in Jannah and I get to see her. So I always hold on to that hope. So if you have a loss of something, always remember Allah will inshallah reward you with, with your patience. Okay. Um, let's see. What if it's cyberbullying? So I'm assuming that has to do with uh, um, blameworthy modesty. If it's cyberbullying, you should also speak up. If you see, you know, someone on social media, you know, treating other people poorly, you can talk to them directly and say, hey, you know, I've noticed that you're leaving really mean comments and trolling people. Um, if you know them, like let's say it's a school classmate or something, you know, have the courage to say something. But, you know, if it's a stranger um, and you're, you know, account, you're, you know, I would always say be careful because uh, some of you are really young, but if you do have social media presence and your name is visible and people can easily find you, you want to kind of watch how you engage people online because there are a lot of bad people online. But I think if you're a young person, I would just, you know, take it to your parents and say, listen, I have, you know, this person or this whoever that's, I think they're being mean and they're being cyberbullying. What should I do about it? And talk it through with your parents. They'll help you figure out if that's something you should get involved in or not. Okay. But be, be cautious just because again, the digital world, we don't have full control and there are a lot of uh, evil people out there. Okay. So let's see, mashallah. Can you continue this class? I love this. Oh, how sweet. <laughs> I just, thank you. That is such a sweet comment. I love doing it. Wallahi, I, I wish I, we were all in one together, room together, because it would be even more engaging, but I love that you guys love it. That uh, really fills my heart. So thank you for that lovely uh, comment. Um, yes, it's called Blameworthy Modesty. Okay, so the class is called Blameworthy Modesty. Um, mashallah, very good. <laughs> okay, awesome, you guys. Well, I think I answered all of your questions that I can see. Um, oh, wait, what did you do? Oh, yeah, no, how many questions? Yeah, I think I've answered all of your questions. Thank you for being here again. You guys are awesome. May Allah bless all of you and protect all of you. Have a wonderful iftar if you're fasting. Remember me and my family in your duas, okay? And remember to study, because remember, I'm going to quiz you guys on Thursday with the rest, okay? And talk it over with your family. Teach them. Be the teacher. You know, if your parents weren't uh, listening, say, let me teach you about some diseases of the heart today, okay? And take it from there. All right, you guys, have a wonderful evening. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.